Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a good weekend. So we'll get started. We got a lot of stuff to cover today. So uh, five, last week's five minute money maker. Um, how excellent are your selling skills? Another point made by Jeff Gittimore. Those of you that do a lot of reading will know who he is. He's a sales expert. Um, he talks about our self uh, our self beliefs. Uh, he says we should ask ourselves these questions to determine how good our, uh, we are selling. What's the biggest sale we've made? What's the biggest sale we've missed? How many unsolicited referrals do you get a year? What's your plan or process to double your sales next year? You should ask yourself those questions, and if they're not a good answer, there's something you need to do. So, because the thing is, if you can answer those questions in the positive, then uh, down here, if you have the scripts and the process down, are you afraid, of, and let's get some answers on this, are you afraid of how much marketing is gonna cost if you have the scripts and the process down? Nick saying no, Jerry saying no, Kevin saying no. Come on, everybody. More people. Okay, good. Uh, I'm debating about whether to feed or not. Am I ever afraid of feeding? No, because I look at everybody being tire kickers and plate lickers. I know they are. But I have confidence that I'm going to be able to convert tire kickers and plate lickers into clients. Now, I do feed them because it slows them down. That's why I feed. Wonder, uh, so I can make the appointment with them. Wondering if you should spend more money on marketing or wait for business to come in. Worried about finding the absolute best marketing, spending countless hours pondering, pondering um, what you should do to market or market with wild abandon. So, I mean, if, you're, if you know the scripts and the process down, you have those things down, you're not going to be worried about marketing. You're just going to go do as much marketing as possible. And, and you don't even have to do that much marketing because how, how many people do you need to close to make a million a year? Guess we get all their assets. You only need to close 57. So you need to do an unbelievable amount of marketing get in front of 57 tire kickers and plate kickers. No, you don't. So, so um, I, I just love asking these questions. And it, it, it's making ourselves accountable to ourselves. I think it, it, the more we can be accountable to ourselves, the better. Uh, the tape breakdown, how do we explain Morningstar to a client? This is a great tape. If you haven't listened to this, listen to this tape because – uh, many guys make this mistake that the guy's making it. They tell, sell, preach, and teach about how morning, how to read a morning star and um, the graphs, et cetera. And this is a good explanation of how you do that and make sure the client gets it and buys into it. So what do we do when life throws us a curveball? More importantly, what do our clients do when life throws us a curveball? For, well, just some real basic ones. What do you do when you lose your wallet? Well, there's lots of things you do when you lose your wallet, but let's talk about, I'm more in, interested in helping prevent problems before they happen instead of uh, what, how you deal with them afterwards. So before uh, you lose your wallet, you should remove as much sensitive information as possible, such as social security cards. Guys, do pe some people still carry their social security card in their wallet? Do some people still carry their social security card in their wallet? Why the heck would anybody, would you ever need to show anybody your social security card? So why would you want that in your wallet? You need to get that out. Identify numbers for things like ATMs. So make sure that um, you, um, uh, a lot of guys, a lot of people will put their passwords or identity uh, pins into their wallet um, as well. Photocopy, every, every, so you got to remove that. A photocopy everything in your wallet to know what you'll actually need. Guys, if I asked you to list everything in your wallet, would you know exactly for sure what what was in your wallet? No. So what you do is you photocopy it so that you can. Uh, know immediately and not miss that health uh, card that you had in there or the coals or the uh, some um, random uh, um, uh, card that you had in there you didn't realize that you had in there. So photocopy everything. And then um, the ni nice thing uh, that you could go to or recommend to clients is creditcard.com's free wallet recovery kit. And it has lots of helpful forms and tips as well. So these are things, uh, the way that you can add value to prospects or clients. So um, uh, write down creditcard.com's free wallet recovery kit. That that would be something you could easily give to people and they would think, oh, that's a nice thing. So what do you do before you lose your phone? Well, one thing you do is install a free software program that will help you track your phone by GPS and then lock it and even erase sensitive data. So there's lots of different places out there you can do that. You can Google how to do that. Make sure all your passwords for websites and apps are complex to make it extremely difficult for others to guess them, because uh, they're obviously going to be able to access a lot of your apps. Make sure that your passwords 
or, um, or websites and apps are, very, are complicated and not all the same. Check your carrier to make, uh, to make a backup of your address book. So a lot of carriers will let you make you a, a, a backup of your address book. And this is so important because how many phone numbers do you know by heart? At this point in your life, how many phone numbers do you know by heart? It's kind of funny uh, uh, how, how few people, you know, especially like millennials and Generation X, etc., they don't know any people's phone numbers. If they lost their phone, they would be screwed. So um, this is a nice thing to talk to your carrier, have people talk to their carrier about. And then think about holding on to your old phone to give you options versus being forced to buy a new one. So, you know, I, I, I always send my phone back to get a, you know, a credit on that. But then if I lose my phone, I'm going to have to buy a brand new phone where otherwise I could limp through on my old phone until, uh, until um, I was able to get a, a phone again. So these are things to do before your phone. What do you do before the power goes out? Well, you could think about a whole house generator. You obviously make sure you have flashlights and know where the flashlights are. And that goes along with batteries as well. Make sure you have backup chargers for your phone, car, solar, etc. Can, in today's world, can power go out for longer than two or three hours? Can it go out for days, in fact? And if that's the case, you're, a lot of people, their only connection to the outside is their cell phone. Make sure you have backup chargers for your phone, car, solar, etc., and maybe even extra batteries. And then a portable radio with a hand crank to charge so that you can actually uh, get a hold of the... Um, uh, outside world. These are things that we're going to talk a little bit later in the call that are essential for just not when the power goes out, but for other things as well. And then what do you do before a uh, disaster happens, whether it's a, your house burns down or your house is flooded, etc. What are things that you need? Well, compile an inventory, and if you're lazy, and so you can write down that inventory, or if you're lazy, just film your inventory. Walk through the house to prove what you own. Back up all irreplaceable photos. That's the one thing that you'll never be able to replace. Make sure you back up those photos. Um, if, the, if, if you have, um, uh, or if people have paper photos, make sure they are digitized and then uh, backed up to the cloud uh, or at least some hard drive. But if you have a hard drive, if you back up things to your hard drive, should you have it on um, site? No, you better have it in a safety deposit box or someplace because whatever burned down or whatever flooded, it's going to kill your your hard uh, your uh, backup as well. So if you do back it, backing up the cloud, at least that protects it. Uh, if you back it up to some uh, uh, piece of um, hardware, then you need to make sure that's off-site. Create a go bag, cash, copies of important documents, phone lists of, the, uh, of your property casualty phone number, banker's phone number, etc. And find, you can find a complete list of what would go into a go bag in 72hours.org backslash build underscore kit dot html. 72hours.org backslash build underscore kit dot html. So are these things that your clients would find valuable or you could bring to your client's attention and give them in like a newsletter or something like that? Yeah, or even a little, uh, uh, maybe these are things if you're doing a, I know that Matt has been reaching out to people and letting people know that hey, you should be considering a barbecue this summer or a luau this summer as a client. Thank you. Would these be? Would this be a nice little kit you could give them? Um, these things that we're talking about, a nice little kit you could give them to make them feel, wow, this is an awesome, not only did we get a good barbecue and have fun, he also gave us some things to, to um, uh, improve our lives or provide value. And then um, what should you do before you lose your data? Uh, before some scammer locks your computer and then uh, and and rants, you know puts ransomware in your computer and doesn't I uh, won't unlock it till you get it. What do you need to do? If you need to back it up. And how often should you be backing up your computer? So uh, Raymond says it. Yeah, Raymond's got it. Raymond says monthly. Yeah, you can do it monthly, weekly, something. Depends on how much you use it. Yeah. So for your work computer, I've been doing it daily. For our, for our clients, depends how active they are, how many of the, uh, photos that they add on a continued basis. I mean, uh, but yeah, monthly is probably good for most people because they're not adding a lot of stuff onto the, on the computer. So that's just little things that you could give to clients or have them think about. Now, what is it that are, uh, uh, those are the little things. What are some of the big things our retired or pre-retired clients should be considering? Well, if we go to the Society of Actuaries, um, they did a study. We all know what actuaries are, so obviously they're, they're the the, um, uh, the experts when it comes to the numbers. And they said planning for retirement is short-term and cash flow focused. 
the three top concerns consistently appear in, uh, as inflation, healthcare expenses, and long-term care expenses. Now, though, <laughs> here's the thing: that's their, that's people's top concerns: inflation, healthcare expenses, and long-term care expenses. And being human, guess what? Although planning for these is not necessarily considered. So people are worried about these things, but what do they not do? So people are worried about these things, but what do they not do? They don't plan for them. So guess th that's good because uh, not good for them, but good for us because we can help them do that. And again, adding value to what our clients, uh, uh, how our clients view us. Retirees uh, retired at a median age of 60. So most retires, uh, most people retired around age 60, but they expected to retire at 65. So they thought they were going to retire at 60, but they didn't retire till 60. Or, uh, I'm sorry, they thought they were going to retire at 65, but they ended up retiring at 60. Why is that the case, guys? Why are people retiring five years sooner than they thought they were going to retire? Yep, health is one thing, Nick. And then yeah, Carl's uh, being forced out of corporate jobs. So unfortunately, a lot of people who are who think they're going to work till 65, guess when they start to get serious about their retirement? At age 60. That, that's a problem because that means that five years they're planning to pump money into their retirement, the five years they're planning to get, get ready for retirement, they weren't able to use those years. They actually were thrown in before they were ready to do that. So again, this is why they need people like us. And then planning horizons of a median of 10 years are too short for a client's potential longevity. Most people don't plan for more than 10 years, but they're going to live for 30 in retirement. And the risk management strategies for retirees are to reduce their spending, increase their savings, and pay off debt. Duh. So financial shocks and unexpected expenses are not fully considered in their planning. Now, we're talking about financial shocks such as home repairs and major dental expenses are unexpected expenses most mentioned that both of which could be expected. Because people are living longer, well, first of all, let's talk about dental repairs. So um, how many of you would go through life missing a front tooth? How many of you would go through your life missing a front tooth? But the greatest generation, guess what they were willing to do? They were willing to do that. I mean, my dad was, a, was a, uh, my dad ran out of money. And when he had <laughs> dental problems, he was going through life with a, out a front tooth until I insisted and paid for the dentist to get that taken care of for him because he thought, well, you know, I'll just live without it. I don't need it. But in, in today's world, are we willing to go through um, life looking like that? No, most people won't do that today. And how much does getting a tooth replaced or a root canal or everything else that you'll need in, as you get older and your teeth <laughs> become more and more damaged – Cheap or can be thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah, Charles, thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, home repairs, and the same thing. The rising cost, I mean, I'm looking at a roof repair. What do you think a roof costs nowadays, guys? Those of you that replace roof, what do they cost nowadays? Five grand? Yeah, mine, mine is minimum. Right now I have cedar shakes, and it would cost 50 grand to replace that. And they said, if you do asphalt, it's going to cost twenty to twenty-five thousand. That's a lot of friggin' money. <laughs> that's a that's a lot of money that people aren't expecting to spend. The rising cost of housing, especially, and what's happening to property taxes? Up, 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 up. Multiple, and then and the problem is not just one of these things happening. The problem is multiple shocks accumulate to a bigger problem than a single shock. The effective shocks may take time over uh, uh, before they create a crisis in living standards. Now, due to financial shocks, the research indicates, what the actuary's research has indicated is that assets were significantly reduced for one-third of retirees. Guys, because of major financial expenses they weren't expecting, assets were reduced significantly for one-third of retirees. Is one-third a big or small number? That's a big number. Now, spending was significantly reduced for one-tenth of the retirees. I don't care, even one-tenth, is that a big or small number? That's a big number to me. And very few have emergency funds set aside for unexpected expenses. About one-fifth, 20% of them could not spend more than $1,000 without harming their security. And we get that. And just as an aside here, which has nothing to do with this call, but I just want to reemphasize this because guys lose sight of it all the time. Guys, that tells us that, the, that most people who are retired have money or most people don't have money. 
it's about a 50-50. So, and when I say a lot, we're talking about a two thirds of people have less than 250. Two thirds of retirees have less than 250,000. So that means one third have 250,000 or more. So this again is an aside, but I just want us to re, uh, uh, um, use this, uh, this, this number as a, as a learning experience. When we're marketing, what percentage of people that we get in front of should have money? A third. That's right. A third, Till. A third. So when I'm doing getting leads, what percentage of those leads should have money? A third. When I'm doing a seminar, what percent of the people coming to that seminar should have money? A third. A third, a third, a third. And it drives me bananas when somebody would tell me, geez, Mike, I, did, I got 10 leads and only three of them had money. What would I say to that person? I got 10 leads and only three of them had money. What would I say to that person? Duh. <laughs> Duh! That's what you should expect. So, does that make sense? So, only a third of the people we get in front of have have money. When we market, we're gonna if we market well, if we market well, we're gonna get in front of people with money. And we're gonna get in people in front of people without money. We're getting in front of tire kickers and tape plate lickers. We're gonna get in front of uh, do-it-yourselfers. We're gonna get. I mean, we're gonna if we if our marketing is working, it means you get in front of everybody. Do you really think there's any marketing out there that's only gonna put you in front of people with money looking to? to buy from you. If there was, how rich, first of all, would we all know about it? Could anybody hide marketing like that? If somebody had marketing like that, they would be, how much money would they spend advertising in a magazine to, to advertise it? The whole magazine would be that particular marketing. That I've got marketing that gets people in front of you with money looking to move their money. I mean, but there is no marketing out there like that. So now back to the topic. So very few have emergency funds. Um, retirees are the resilient though. At least three quarters of them were able to manage somewhat in their financial constraints. But do you see what they're saying? What are the key words here in that sentence? What are the key words in this sentence? Manage somewhat. Man so that, does that mean they're living the lifestyle they thought they were gonna have or they've had to downgrade their lifestyle? They had to downgrade their lifestyle. And that's what people are afraid of. They don't want to move back. They're not looking to become rich. They just don't want to move backwards. Long-term care and divorce were the shocks that caused the most significant damage. And then children needing longer-term support was also a major cause, which we're going to talk about here in a second. So this is uh, the actual numbers. So retirees are in – so the ba baby boomers are basically aqua, and the greatest generation is green. So baby boomers are aqua. And, ba and the greatest generation is in the green here. So 28% uh, of baby boomers had major home repairs or upgrades. Why is that? Why, did, why is there almost, was it uh, four times more baby boomers have had major home repairs and upgrades than, than the greatest generation? Well, think about this. How big a houses do baby boomers live in compared to the greatest generation? Yeah, and until uh, also brings up Ben brings up, uh, you got to keep up with the Joneses. And you know, how many of you walked into a grandma's house and her her carpeting was thirty years old? You, there was no there was no there was no nylon left. All it was was burlap. I mean, <laughs> so so the greatest generation is willing to put up with a lot. And plastic on the couch, right, Fred? So the greatest generation is willing to put up with a lot poorer house than the baby boomers are. Major dental expenses. Again, why are baby boomers more, uh, uh, much more, almost four times more, or three times more than um, than the greatest generation? First of all, we're living longer, and also they have lower tolerance for what? The greatest generation would buy. Yeah, they want the million dollar smile, right, Till? So the the greatest generation would are the people that you see on funniest videos skydiving, and their dentures fall out of their mouth because they would go get the cheap dentures, and they'd be satisfied with that. Are baby boomers satisfied with that? No. And do, do, do baby boomers spend more than they should on keeping up the house and keeping up their smile? Well, they, I mean, uh, on my block, basically everybody has uh, of, of at least 150 grand of cars in their, car, in their garage. Do you really think everybody on my block can afford $150,000 of cars in the garage? These, that, that, our, Parents would never have done, 
never have done that. So we're just used to, and, and we'll go into debt. Baby boomers will go into debt to maintain that million dollar smile or their home or their car. They, they have no problem with that. And that's fine until what? Until there's a hiccup. And then they're really, really up the creek. A drop in home value of 25% or more. Illness or disability. Now that, our, the greatest generation, has a, a outpaced us. Now, this is, do you think this is gonna change or not change? Do you think aqua is gonna get closer to the green uh, as time goes on? Yes, because of diabetes and all. I mean, right now we're seeing um, the life expectancy in the US going up or going down. The, the, we're the only developed country in the world right now where the life expectancy is going down, and why is that? It's not because of in, infant mortality, it's because why? Disease and drugs, yeah. We've got the uh, opioid epidemic, and then we also have, geez, I, I think there, I read something that by 2035, they figure 90% of retirees will have diabetes. <laughs> so, and diabetes causes what? Yeah, cost of care too, Kevin, exactly right. Running out of assets, 15 and 16, sudden loss of value of 25% of their, of, that, of their accounts, 14%. I think that, well, the only reason why this is only 14% is what? How many people have seen more than a sudden loss of 25% of their assets? In the last 20 years, how many people have seen a 25%, 14% or most? Yeah, most. So what does that tell you? What does that tell you about people's memories? They have poor and short memories going into Medicaid, family emergencies, and then we go, go down. So these are real numbers. Are these small numbers or big numbers? These are big numbers. This happens to a lot of people. And again, one of the things that uh, uh, baby boomers are facing is they're taking care of not just, I mean, the greatest generation did not take care of their parents for the most part. We are. We're taking care of our parents and we're taking care of our kids because they're staying uh, dependent longer. And and our because our parents are becoming... um are living longer, they become dependent on us too. So we're in the sandwich generation. Is this something anybody that, uh, hey, when I started in 19 financial planning in, 19, in the late 1980s and 90s or early 90s, was there anything being, were we being trained at all to prepare our clients for the sandwich, gener to being a sandwich generation? Is that even on the radar? No. No, is it, take care of your own retirement. That's not the case anywhere. We're taking care of our own retirement. We're taking care of our parents' retirement. And we're trying to support our kids because they can't get up and running. So it's, this is a big problem for people. And again, we talked about um, unexpected financial uh, concerns, for example. Is the, uh, is the um, sewer pipe running from your house to the street covered by the city or by you? Yeah, and is that... Uh, a, a few hundred bucks, or is that 10,000 10, bucks? Yeah, that's lots of money. So there's lots of things that our clients aren't thinking of. And how much money does it take to insure that? It's like three or four bucks a month is all it takes. <laughs> so these are things that we should uh, encourage our clients, especially, well, and here's the thing. Here's the sad thing. Or is a sewer pipe more or less likely to to break in a newer neighborhood than an older neighborhood? I wish I had the article on this. A newer neighborhood and an older neighborhood. It's the same. You know why? Because the newer neighborhoods did, didn't have the quality as an older neighborhoods, and the older neighborhoods are what? Old. <laughs> so... Uh, so the newer neighborhoods just didn't uh, uh, put these things together the way they should. The older neighborhoods did, but they're old and they're, it's a crumbling infrastructure. So for a few uh, for a few dollars a month, these are things that that our clients should be thinking about to not put a huge dent in their retirement. Seventh, and again, how many things in in um, people's property casualty, especially with their home insurance, are people not aware of? Well, there was a study done by Oliver Wyman. And many affluent clients' uh, home insurance is woefully inadequate because it has been not been updated for years. Guys, think about this. When was the last time you updated your home insurance? You know when the last time I've ever updated my home insurance? 
every time I move. And then once you're there, guess what? Stays the same. How many clients are like that? That they haven't updated it since they first purchased this on their homes. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, home costs increase. They've remodeled. And when you remodel, what happens to your home value and the replacement cost? It goes straight up. Changes in policies uh, that weren't uh, aware. Now, how do they change the policies, guys? Do they, does the agent come out and tell the client, hey, we've changed your policy, or do they send it out in the annual uh, fine print that they send out uh, once a year? And the fine print, endorsements in the mail, exactly. 77% of those surveyed, all, all affluent clients of advisors, said they would appreciate their advisor giving property and cash to the advice. Guys, what's the importance of that? 77% of those surveyed, all of them, affluent clients of advisors, said they would appreciate their advisor giving property casualty advice. So our property casualty checklist is a throwaway or something that people actually want? Is it a throwaway or people, yeah, they want it. 37% said they would actually even switch advisors to get it. So guys, the things that we're covering for people are pe things that they really are interested in and do want help with and has nothing to do with their investments. Um, we talk about medical costs. More than 60% of all bankruptcy filings are directly related to healthcare costs. So over half of the people that go bankrupt is not because they're overspending on cars or overspending on, even though overspending on cars are gonna cause, uh, could cause uh, this to happen sooner, but it's, it's the, the actual final straw that breaks the camel's back is healthcare costs. In fact, there's 643,000 uh, people go bankrupt every year in the United States because of medical bills. That is crazy. And does Medicare cover all of the things that people need for health care when they're retired? Those of you that have seen the numbers, what's the average couple? What's the average couple, not including long-term care, not including long-term care, what's the average couple going to spend in their lifetime from the day they retire to the day they die, the average couple, on costs, out-of-pocket costs, are not covered by Medicare. Yeah, 250 to 300,000. 250 to 300,000, that's exactly right, depending on who you look at. So these are things they need to think about. And here's the sad thing. How long does it take for a forest to grow? How long does it take for a forest to grow? Long, decades. How long does it take for a forest to go away? How long does it take to build a building? How long does it take for that building to disappear? See, unfortunately, everything in life that's good happens overnight or takes time. Everything in life that's good happens overnight or takes time. Takes time. But things that are bad, how quickly can things that are bad destroy the years of the, that, that took to build up the good things? In a nanosecond. I mean, and we've seen it in the markets, right? This is in the, the, since 1871. Wow, this is awesome. Oh, wait, we lost most of it. Oh, wow, this is awesome. Wait, we lost most of it. Oh, wait, this is awesome. Oh, we lost three quarters of it. Oh, wow, this is awesome. Now, you, you see when I say three quarters, it only went down 54%, did, but did we lose three quarters of it? Is it, if it, is it even, Stephen, is the amount that we lose uh, the same, uh, um, uh, related the same to what we gain, or does it have a bigger effect when we lose something? So. Yeah, it is more rated, exactly right. So in the last 20 years, there's been uh, uh, nine black swan events that changed the history of finance forever. The Asian financial crisis in 1997, many of you don't even remember this, but we saw international stocks tumble by 60%. The dot-com crash in 2000, almost all of us are, uh, are familiar with this, and trillions of dollars of loss. The NASDAQ lost 78%. How many years did it take for the NASDAQ to get back out to the ground even again? How many years? 17 years, Fred, right, 17 years. Uh, then 9-11, uh, we saw the markets plummet. Uh, global financial crisis caused by you know, the uh, uh, real estate bubble in the United States, which dragged everybody down in 2007 or 2008. The European sovereign debt crisis, when all the European countries were having you know, uh, Greece and Italy and everybody is having all the problems with their debt. Is that completely over, guys? No. Uh, the Fukushima uh, 
uh, nuclear disaster when the, uh, the tidal wave hit the Fukushima plant and brought it down. It caused a tumbling. The oil crisis, and this is an oil crisis that's the opposite of the 1970s oil crisis. What was this oil crisis, guys? The opposite of the 1970s OPEC uh, embargo. What happened to this? Oil became cheap. Who in their right mind would have thought oil becoming cheap would be a bad thing? But it caused unforeseeable financial effects. Black Monday, uh, um, where China's stock market, where the government, uh, the, the amount of money invested soon exceeded the rate in which those invested companies could grow. Chinese government decided to devalue the plan, the yuan, plan backfires, causing Black Monday. Within three weeks, the market was down 30%. And of course, the Chinese in their in their infinite intelligence, what they do then? What they do? They backed off, rebooting the yuan, and then the markets came back, but now they still have the what? Instead of saying, well, I guess we, uh, I guess we um, bit the bullet and we're back to a more normalized market, what did they do? They are back to the same unbridled un, uh, 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 growth that, that is really not indicative of truly what's happening in their economy. Brexit, when the, the British left, uh, caused uh, all sorts of problems with the uh, international markets. So those are all things that happened just in the last 20 years. But what are the things that we should worry about in the future? Well, according to the National Intelligence Council, there's six catastrophic events likely to happen in the next 12 years. So I want to vote on all of these things. One of the things they say is a pandemic. Do you think there could be a pandemic, bird flu, Ebola, or whatever it may be, in the next 10 years, between now and 2030? That's what they're saying, between now and 2030. Do you think that? Yeah. And guys, what we're talking about is not a few people, and I'm sorry, it's sad when, when um, like Ebola happens in Africa and you have 1,000 people die and a couple of people die in the U.S., but a true pandemic is we're talking about category one would be losing 90,000 people. Category four would be losing a, a, a million to two million people in the U.S. Guys, that, that's like, in, in a pan, that'd be like just in one state. What would happen, what would happen if 15,000 people died in your state or 126,000 people died in your state? What would people be like? What would happen to the, the functioning of your economy in your state if that happened? Yeah, panic, panic, Fred. Right, Susan, panic. So what would that do to financial markets? Ain't nobody buying things. Guess what that's going to do? Crush it. Crush it, crush it, crush it. And do pandemics, are they, are they easily stamped out or do they take a long time to stamp out? Long time, right? And think about this. Do you need, if you're in the middle of a pandemic, do you need more money or less money at that point? You need more. You need to be huddling. You need to be uh, figuring out ways to stay away from the general population, and that costs moolah. So that's one thing they said. Um, potential climate effects. They're saying, for example, the deforestation and everything they're doing is going to cause more wildfires. Have we seen more wildfires in this country? Not just in California, but all over the place. Coastal areas, are we seeing more flooding? Every time there's a storm, even if it's not a hurricane, what happens to Louisiana and Florida and, and New York and Boston? What happens to those? Yeah, yeah even in Colorado, it's had uh, wildfires. Flooding. What's happening to agriculture? If those of you that have um, farmers uh, for clients, what's happening to their, oops, their, their crops? Getting, it, it, are they having more or less pests, more or less disease? Up and up and up, Raymond says, exactly right. Water resources, well, we're already seeing, I mean, we're already, the world's watching right now um, Cape Town and their D-Day for when they run out of money. And is that the case everywhere, in, in, not everywhere, but several uh, places, even the U.S., where the water is becoming a problem? Species in natural areas, loss of habitat, species in cryosphere, that's not really affecting us economically. It's sad, but it's not affecting us economically. But health, weather-related mortality, infectious diseases, air quality, earth, is this a problem? Are we seeing this guy on the uprise? Yeah. So climate change is causing all sorts of problems. Could the Eurozone collapse? 
heck, with everything that happened with the G7 and everything, I mean, all this stuff that's being caused by all sorts of reasons, is not is it helping the eurozone or is it is it hurting the eurozone? With the U.S. saying, "Oh, we're pulling out of the G7 and blah 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 blah," is that helping the eurozone or hurting? It's hurting it. And if the eurozone goes down, what's going to happen to the world market? Yeah. Are we going to say, "Well, luckily we're not part of the eurozone, so we're immune, so the U.S. is immune." Who cares? The eurozone's going down and their markets are going down. What's going to happen to U.S. markets, guys? Is it only going to be the international markets or are our markets going to go down too? Yeah, the global economy will go down. And like we just talked about, China <laughs> had that hiccup where they lost 30% of their market. Instead of leaving the yuan devalued, they propped it right back up because, the, because they're afraid the market would go down even first, further. So guess where they are right now? In a better place than they were when that happened or a worse place than they were when that happened? The worst place. What, how, do, do, so, uh, I didn't talk. What's the, what, is there a likelihood that the Eurozone could collapse in the next 10 years or 12 years? Is there a, 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 like, a likelihood? What do you think the, the likelihood of the uh, Chinese having a major um, uh, problem in the next 12 years? Weapons of mass destruction. What's the, what's the chance of a weapon of mass destruction being used on on our soil in the next 12 years. This is the one that scares the bejesus out of me. We've already, if you've been following the news, how many countries now have now hacked in to our military and our infrastructure systems? They haven't done anything with it, but how many countries for sure have hacked into our infrastructure in the US? Well, too many is right. Three that I know of for sure, but I would agree with Nick, too many. But Raymond's saying 21 different countries. Now, they haven't done anything yet, but they have a, their finger on the button that could shut down our power systems. What would happen if the power systems in the U.S. shut down, or all the cell phone systems in the U.S. shut down, or even a third of the power systems in the U.S. shut down? What would happen? Panic. And what would happen to your clients' monies? Oh, by the way, how would your clients access their money? How would they pull money out of the market if the power's down? How are you going to pull money out of the market if the power's down? can't. So when the power finally comes up, geez, you were worth a million when the power went down, power comes up, now what are you worth? If you're in the market. A heck of a lot less. Nothing you can do about it. But my money manager can get me out in time. <laughs> really? Can the money manager get you out in time if there's a cyber attack? Everybody answer this. Well, the FIA protects you. Exactly right. I agree with that. Solar flares, again, can shut down all the satellites in, the, in around the world. So what would happen if all the satellites around the world, GPS stopped working, communication satellites quit working? What would happen? How long would it take for them to get satellites back up and all that stuff? What would happen to the market as we know it? Is this a possibility? Guys, those of you, I'm a science freak. Those of you that follow any science whatsoever, is this a possibility? Are our satellites shielded against solar flares? They are, but not, but not to the kind of solar flares that can happen. Uh, this is a big one that the, the U.S. Intelligence uh, uh, Council said is a big problem. U.S. disengagement. The U.S. has long considered itself a keeper of the peace around the world. The NIC, the National uh, Intelligence Council, says that if the U.S. withdraws from global affairs completely, either out of choice or necessity, it will send, send shockwaves around the world. Within a, out a second in command to step into the neutral power, super uh, power, countries that normally exercise restraint will quickly descend into an extended period of global anarchy. Guys, what are we? What's happening right now in the friggin' world? What is happening right now in the world? Caused by what? Yeah, nationalism. That's a good thing or a bad thing? I understand how how people who are not educated would say that's a, uh, a, a good thing. But those of you that have studied anything about economics, those of you that understand anything about trade, any of those of you who put any trust in, in the National in, in Intelligence Council, which is uh, uh, put together by guys who are not dumb and they're not Republicans, they're not Democrats and independents, they're, they're just think tanks. That's a bad thing. So could any of these things in the next, happen in the next 12 years? 
any of them could and some of them are happening. But you know what? I don't think any of those things are going to cause the market to crash. You know why? This is a trick question. I don't think any of those things are going to cause, even though I think they're all likely to happen and they may cause the market to crash, I don't think they're going to be the thing that makes the market crash. Why do I think those aren't going to be the things that make the market crash? What's the definition of a black swan? It's never happened before or is extremely rare, highly improbable events. It takes people by surprise as they never imagined such a thing happening. That's why. The thing that's going to crush the markets, we all, most of us have agreed that those things that we went through right there, all of those things could absolutely and probably will happen in the next 12 years. But the thing that's going to crush us are the things that we don't even see coming. That's the problem. There's no way to prepare for black swans. It'll be something out of the blue. So top 10 risks in terms of likelihood, extreme weather events, of course, we're seeing those, natural disasters, cyber attacks, that's the one I'm afraid of, data fraud or theft, failure of climate, change of mitigation adaptation, large-scale involuntary migration, we're seeing some of that, man-made environmental disasters like, uh, like um, nuclear power plants, uh, terrorist attacks, illicit trade, asset bubbles in a major economy. Those are the things that are likely to happen the impact of those things, obviously, a weapons of mass destruction is going to cause the biggest problem. Extreme weather events cause billions and billions of problems, so do natural disasters. So you can see any of these things could cause what? Markets to do what? So I'm, you know, I'm not saying let's buy ammunition and beans, because if we really believe the world as we know it's going to end, we should be buying ammunition and beans. That's what we should be buying. No, I'm saying that we. I still am a big proponent that mankind is is. Uh, I'm very optimistic that mankind always can is smart enough to grow itself out of its problems intellectually. It'll it'll develop new things to to fix uh, um, uh, uh, pests with agriculture, new ways to grow money. I'm uh, yeah. We need time. I agree with that. But I think that we can fix those things. But uh, and I, that's the main point I think, Dale. Is we need time. Those things can take time. We can always get ourselves out of big problems, but it takes time. But do our clients have a lot of time? Our retired clients, do they have a lot of time to wait for things to get fixed? No. So, so based on this information, what's the max your client should want exposed to market risk? What's the max? Yeah, 50, 40, no more than half of their money should, should be in the markets because there's so many things outside of their control. They need to have money that's guaranteed that that will not move backwards. They still need to grow and do FIAs grow. Yeah, for the last 18 years they've grown more than the friggin' market has. But and they've grown without the, the fear of moving backwards. I don't know if they're going to grow more than the market did in the next 18 years, but I do know that they're mess that they're they're 100 percent less likely to go backwards than the market in the next 12 years. Make sense? So. When you've mastered the crib notes and motive, your daily practice of miffed and gots, five-minute money making breakdowns, that's when you're going to get the client to move all your money. We're in the we're in the summer now, so make sure you're doing these things, guys. And I didn't mean to be a bummer today, uh, but I, I just want us to be aware, so we can make sure our clients are aware that they got to be prepared not for the good, not for the bad, but for both. Make sense? Have a great rest of the week. We'll talk to you next Monday. Thanks, everybody.